Kiss record to school. This, this band called Kiss. And, um, it was like second or third grade. Yeah. And I knew when I saw that album cover for Love Gun, was the name of the album, that the circus would never pale in comparison <laughs> to a Kiss concert, probably. So I was obsessed. And I was like, I wanted to start playing music and play rock and roll. So I started playing drums, much to my parents' dismay. <laughs> and my, I, um, I begged my parents. I saw this concert uh, uh, commercial when I came home from school one day on the uh, cable box. It was the slide for the cable box back then. It was around the time the pyramids were built. <laughs> I saw this guy come on the TV and say, like, Kiss is coming to the Omni of Atlanta for 
for two nights on New Year's Eve, and I just like lost my mind. And I was like, oh my God, I don't want Christmas. I don't want my birthday. They're both two months apart. I don't care. I just want to go see this band. So my mom and dad got me tickets and the whole thing to go see the kids. <laughs> I was eight years old, okay? and if you knew my dad, uh, he, uh, we showed up, we got into the balcony, we were in the nosebleeds, and um, everybody there, this was 1977, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it was, and um, I was sitting in the balcony, and um, you know, on Twitter. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, no, oh, no, it was the original Twitter. I actually looked over at somebody and told them how I was feeling. <laughs> which would never go down nowadays. It's a kind of I should also mention I rode in the back of a pickup truck all the way there. <laughs> and, uh, and I just remember, and it smelled really funny in there. <laughs> For an eight-year-old, I've never smelled that. <laughs> but it was pretty awesome. I was just like in wonderment, you know. Went out and people were crazy and it was just fucking awesome. And my dad was wearing, he was wearing this, uh, he was wearing this brown leather blazer <laughs> that his mother, my grandmother, had gotten him for his like 30th birthday, which is crazy to think. He was only 30 when he got that. I know. But my dad was a big, burly, like southern redneck man. He had a beard down to here and it was just like, he was Big Butch. That was his name, he was Big Butch. And uh, I just remember these two guys dressed as uh, Paul and Gene behind us. <clears throat> and they kept like spilling the beer like, on the back of my dad, you know. I didn't think much about that at eight years old. You know, I'm just like, oh, whatever. I'm just, I can't wait for this to happen. But I could see my dad getting irritated. My dad didn't belong there anyway. And he was really uncomfortable. He was about as uncomfortable as a whore in church there. <laughs> and, uh, he, uh, some of the lights going out and 20,000 stoners going ballistic and going nuts. And, uh, and I think it was maybe during the second song, I looked over and all I could see was my dad turned around the other way. And he had Gene Simmons in a necklock. <laughs> I went in this for spilling the beer all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I mean, God, God help Gene Simmons. <laughs> My dad was a big man. But it didn't stop us from having a good time. We did leave before the encore because my dad was over it. But, uh, <laughs> it was the best moment of my life and it changed me forever. I started playing music the next day. And um, so when I started playing music, I players and I got in a band as I told you about earlier with the foster virginity story. <laughs> but um, after that, you know, I got pretty serious and I was like, I gotta get out of I gotta get out of Georgia because there's nobody here playing original music. It's all covers. So I wanted to go to LA. And my dad, he's kind of was still pretty disconnected with me and the rest of the world at the time because I think he was going through his midlife crisis. You know, he was like 40 something my age, basically. You know, <laughs> he, uh, you know, he had just lost both of his parents, which was rough, but, you know, being a teenager, I was disconnected, and I didn't really care, sadly, because I didn't really know what loss was about. I'd had my ass fight my whole life. So, I was ready to kind of go out and do it on my own. And my dad didn't really have a lot to say to me up until that point. So, he... The day I left, I was going uh, out to LA. He, he said, Well, 
you're not going to go to college, obviously. And I said, no, man, I don't really care about that. And um, he said, yeah, well, I didn't either. And he didn't really finish school, so I think he was just worried that his only son that was going to carry on walking with him was not going to really amount to much. Which I can understand that. And good, you know, making it in music is like getting struck by lightning. It's the same, same chances. But my dad, he he just looked at me and he said, you know, you know, I'd rather you regret the things you don't try. So I went out there and I ended up having a pretty good run with it right off the bat. My band got signed to a record deal, a pretty good record deal pretty quickly, which frightened all of us and scared all of us. And we had no idea that it, we could do that. I mean, I was able to buy five for a dollar macaroni and cheese all by myself. <laughs> I lived on fifteen dollars a week and I never asked my parents for a dime because they didn't have it to give me anyway, you know. But um I just remember a shift happening in my pops at that point. And he uh I came home to visit him. It was the first time you know I'd ever seen my dad I'm excited about what I was doing. Because <laughs> he you know, he was skeptical, and that's cool, I get it, you know. But to see my dad like, cry and smile at the same time it was pretty big. I didn't seem to do either. So, um, I went on the road after that a long time. I had a lot of failures, lots of failures, lots of bands. Make it, not make it. Make it, not make it. And, uh, you know, finally, um, my dad was out of the show one day, which was pretty wild, because, you know, all of a sudden he's, I can't get rid of him, and he's like showing up at all the shows. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy had been working for at t for 27 years. And he looked at me one day after a show, and he goes, he said, he said, you really love your job, don't you? And I said, well, I wouldn't call the job, Dad. I've only made about 500 bucks in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, yeah, but you, you love what you do. And I remember kind of thinking that was a big moment for he and I because he obviously Same year, he ended up um, inexplicably quitting his job at uh, AT and T. And he looked. He asked me one day. He goes, "Hey, do you need somebody to sell merch?" <laughs> we play to about fifty people a night, man. There's no way. Like, but yeah, yeah. You know, man. I want to get in the van. And he did. And he got in the van. You know, all seven of us. And I will, I'll never forget it because it was the best times of my life. It's the only time I've ever seen my dad, you know, having a, a great time. I would see him in the back of the room at these clubs, smaller than this, and we'd be up on stage. I'd be up on stage playing, like sweating my ass off and just jumping off. Back to the folk when I look back right there and see my dad at the merch booth talking to like the only three girls in the place. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just he loved it, you know. And uh, it was just nice to see him having a good time. So those were the best times being able to spend after the show sitting in like a Motel 6 on the floor in a carpet and hotel room dividing up. Twenty dollars each, and drinking a shitty bottle of vodka together. I never got to do that with him, so I'm, I'm really bummed that it took till my mid twenties to do that. But at least it happened, you know. And, um, he became my biggest fan. I couldn't get rid of him. He was at every show with an 
oxygen tank on his back because he couldn't breathe for the last five years. He was alive, but he would still be at every show. I went home to see him a couple of years ago. And um, he was in the hospital. And usually he's that kind of guy. It's like, uh, he's like, you know, don't come home. It's all good. I'll be fine. I'll be home tomorrow. See him. See him. And I, I took that page. First time when I got there and I saw him, that he looked at me and he said, he said, you're not going anywhere, are you?
Sunt